Greetings students, Mr. Little here. And today we're going to have a look at chapter 33, part two. That is the general course of World War I. And I wanted to start with a quote from British diplomat Edward Gray, in which he talked about how the lamps are going out all over Europe and we shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. Which is really interesting because lamps and lighting usually have connotations of like enlightenment and civic thought. Uh, and Edward Gray was predicting that the consequences of this war, this war that was just beginning in 1914, was going to last a lifetime and maybe longer. I think his prediction was prescient, but let's go ahead and explore how the war played out. So by the end of this presentation, you should be able to answer the two following questions. One, how did governments around the world manage the economic and cultural situations of their countries over the course of World War I? And two, how did the technological and political changes of the 1800s influence the course of World War I? So with that second question, I'm asking you to think back, think back to units five and six, and think about how like the industrial revolution and imperialism and the political revolutions influenced the course of World War I. But with that said, let's have a quick look. If you're really curious about the general front of where combat was happening uh, and who was fighting in what area, you can feel free to pause the video and have a look at this chart that I've put together, which is the major fronts of where World War I was fought and who was involved there. We're not gonna talk about all of these. This is just a general overview. And if you'd like to know more, feel free to do some research on your own time. We will talk about a few key points, but we're not gonna go over a lot of military history here. We're gonna kind of take a wide look at this. So here's a map of the major fronts in Europe. Now, the original alliance of the, of the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance eventually broke down and a few people switched sides and some new people joined. So for example, Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire would join Austria, Hungary, and Germany. And these four would collectively become known as the Central Powers, whereas Britain, France, and Russia would be joined by Italy, Greece, Romania, Brazil, the United States, and Japan, and they would all become known as the Allied Powers or the Allies. One thing to notice about the Central Powers is that because they were literally located in the center of Europe, for the most part, they were constantly fighting a two-front war. Almost every major Central Power had to fight on two fronts at some point which is what made their military operations very difficult, which may in the end have contributed in part to their defeat. One thing that jumps out at you when you look at these maps. So let's talk about the Western Front. And this is the one that gets a lot of attention in American schools because this is where the United States fought. The Western Front was a theater in Northern France, which saw Germany and some detachments of Austrian soldiers facing off against British and French soldiers, and then later on American soldiers as well. And this is also where you have the famous trenches, trench warfare, the digging of trenches, and the creation of a system of trenches uh, protected by barbed wire, uh, space between two trenches known as no man's land that soldiers would have to climb out over their trench and charge into enemy fire and probably get mowed down by machine guns or stuck in barbed wire or shot by a sniper or blown up by an artillery shell. All of this was in part because of what we call the ascendancy of the defense. And that is that the technological change that had occurred over the course of the 1800s and the Industrial Revolution made it very easy to defend a held position, but very difficult to attack and take a position. So if you think about the new technology that saw prominence during this war that hadn't been seen before, except to a limited extent during the Russo-Japanese War, such as barbed wire, machine guns, more accurate artillery, and poison gas. These technologies made it much harder to attack and take an enemy position, because even if you outnumber the enemy, a machine gun could mow down half of your men, barbed wire would make it harder for you to physically get there, and poison gas could drive you away if you were not careful. You might remember that old motto from imperialism, which is, Whatever happens, we have got a Maxim gun, and they have not, except literally now everybody had a Maxim gun, and they were slaughtering each other in vast numbers. And when I say vast numbers, I do truly mean vast numbers. We're talking hundreds of thousands of men dying in battles over the course of weeks, months, and years, but probably the most bloody battle, and the one that sticks out in the mind of a lot of historians, as well as people who study World War I, is the Battle of the Somme which took place in 1916, about two years into the war, in which a British attack failed spectacularly and 20,000 men were killed in a single day. If attacking wasn't terrible enough, trench life itself was pretty grim. Unless you were in one of the nicer trenches in the rear, most trenches on the front line were literally just holes in the ground that were connected together. So rain and mud became a major issue. Rats became a major issue. Your food would rot away really easily. Uh, people got sick. Wounds became infected. It was a very nasty type of war. Some people have described fighting in trenches as months of boredom punctuated by moments of extreme terror. 
Now, one thing to note about the trenches is that they were created, they were the result of this ascendancy of the defense where you had to literally dig in to protect yourself from being killed by these new technologies. But it was also these new technologies that allowed trench warfare to eventually be overcome. So for example, at the Battle of Cambrai in 1917, about three years into the war, the British used a combination of creeping artillery, aerial reconnaissance, and tanks all together in a combination to break through the German lines. There's a video that I'm gonna link in the description of this battle being depicted via Legos. And I'm a major Lego fan, so you can go check that out. But it's worth noting that technology made trench warfare necessary, but technology also eventually broke trench warfare by providing the firepower, the protection, and the mobility needed to break through the defenses of a trench system. Now, the Eastern Front was a little bit different. The Eastern Front saw uh, an initial Russian advance into Germany and Austria, followed by a German-Austrian counterattack and advance into Russia. The Eastern Front was so wide because Russia was so big that there weren't actually very many trenches except in very particular battles. And it was a very mobile war by comparison. And it was also, for the most part, a war that didn't go well for Russia. Russian leadership was pretty poor, and because Russia was not a fully industrialized society, it had difficulty providing its soldiers with enough ammunition and guns to fight an effective war. And as a result, by 1917, three years into the war, perhaps two million Russians had died fighting. And the shortages of food, fuel, and ammunition, both at the front and at home, fueled discontent among the population. And this also included national sentiments among the non-Russian population. So for example, in 1916, there was a major uprising in Russian Central Asia against Russian settlers. And Polish nationalists took the opportunity to fight for Russia's enemies, although I should note that some Polish individuals, some Polish military units did fight on behalf of Russia. But the point is that the Russian Empire was in a very, very tough situation. And this, all of this defeat and the shortage and this discontent eventually did lead to a revolution, what's known as the March Revolution. On International Women's Day in February of 1917, a general a march turned into a general strike that eventually forced the Tsar, that is the absolute ruler of Russia, to abdicate his power to a democratic government. We will talk more about that democratic government next time, but it's really worth noting that the failure of the Russian government to effectively manage the war against Austria and Germany eventually would lead to their collapse. Now, we've talked a little bit about the Eastern Front and the Western Front, but what about the home front? What about what about civilian life during World War I? The thing about World War I is World War I is what we call a total war, and World War II is also going to be a total war. A total war is where a government uses everything at its disposal, all means, all abilities, all powers, to put everything towards the war. And so, for example, this means things like nationalization and rationing. Nationalization is when a government takes control of an industry or a particular company. So, for example, Great Britain took control of its railways in 1914, which is pretty unprecedented since Great Britain had always had a hands-off attitude for their economy. In other words, don't interfere with the economy, let it be. And nonetheless, they saw this war as so important that they needed to take control of their railways to make sure that ammunition and soldiers could get to the front. In Germany, the realization that the British blockade of the North Sea would prevent additional food from coming to Germany forced them to begin rationing in 1914. Rationing is a major undertaking because the government has to very carefully calculate how much food you're going to get every day, issue ration cards, and punish people who break the rules. And so this major expansion of government control in the name of fighting the war was a major development in world history. This also resulted in great changes for women over the course of the war. Many women were called upon to do work they previously had not been able to do. So for example, the giant uh, steel manufacturing company in Germany called Krebs Steel uh, at the beginning of the war employed almost no women. But by the end of the war, almost 30% of its workforce were women needed to replace all the men going off to fight uh, in the Great War. Women also served as ambulance drivers and nurses, but in some cases, women also served as spies and soldiers. In Russia, famously, after three years of fighting, they needed to raise soldiers and they called on the women of Russia to do so. And so across Russia, a number of women's military battalions were formed and most famously, perhaps the Russian Women's Battalion of Death was formed. Sounds like a, a metal band name, but nonetheless, women contributed greatly to the war, and they would be rewarded in most cases after the war with increased rights and increased opportunities. However, the other side of uh, increased rights, increased opportunities was the loss of civil liberties. One thing about a total war is that the government doesn't tend to tolerate dissent of the war. This usually means conscientious objectors, people who 
don't want to fight in a war or have a moral objection to committing violence, uh, were usually put in jail. Freedom of the press was restricted. Anything that could potentially make the government look bad was restricted. Labor leaders or socialists were beaten in the streets in the case of the United States and Great Britain for their criticism of the government or threats to go on strike in the middle of a war. The government in need of soldiers enacts what we call conscription, and that is required military service. So you could get called up to military service uh, even if you don't necessarily want to go because the government needs you know more soldiers to fill the trenches. And of course, probably beginning in World War One, but it, what has been a feature of almost every major war ever since would be the proliferation of propaganda posters. And you can see one on the right here, which is a little girl asking her father what he did in the Great War. And the underlying message of the, the poster is simply, you know, if you don't serve in the Great War, your future children are going to think you're a coward because you didn't serve, right? Propaganda posters, I might add, are a great way if you are practicing your DBQ document analysis, go practice with some propaganda posters. They're a great way to sort of read between the lines uh, and sort of interpret documents. So they're great practice for that. So in short, total war meant total government control to fight the war, and this affected every part of everybody's lives. Now, of course, a war between imperial powers in Europe would eventually spread to the colonies, and it did, with terrible consequences. So one of the Allies' first objectives was to take the German colonies, which wasn't hard for most of them, except for German East Africa, where there was a spirited resistance by local German soldiers as well as their African auxiliaries. The four-year-long campaign to try to defeat the Germans in East Africa by the British, French, and Belgians and Portuguese soldiers led to a devastation of the countryside and the deaths of perhaps tens of thousands of Africans, not necessarily from even combat, but just from starvation and disease. Empires also used the promise of territory to entice combatants to join them. Japan was promised German colonies in China, and the Sharif of Mecca, that is the keeper of Mecca, Hussein bin Ali, was promised to be the head of a new Arab state if he assisted the British in defeating the Ottomans in the Middle East. However, as will be revealed, uh, this was actually a lie, and the British were not going to give Hussein bin Ali his own state. Instead, they had agreed to divide up the Middle East between them and the French in the secret Sykes-Picot Agreement. Imperial territories were also a major source of soldiers for the war effort. So for example, the British, with their Anzac troops, that is soldiers from Australia, but also soldiers from Canada and New Zealand, along with soldiers from India, over a million plus served in the Western Front or on the auxiliary fronts in the Middle East and East Africa. France brought almost a million soldiers from Africa to fight in France, and in the German colony of East Africa, the German administration employed almost 20,000 soldiers in their guerrilla campaign to try to outlast the British attackers. This involved more than just combat troops. For example, the French recruited thousands of Chinese and Vietnamese laborers to come to France and work behind the lines to free up men to fight out the front. It would not be too much of a stretch to say that the victory of the Allies in World War I, at least in part, rested on their massive colonial empires. That is not to say the colonies went along with it willy-nilly, and there were several notable examples of resistance in the colonies to service in World War I. For example, in Singapore in 1915, early in the war, a group of Muslim sepoys revolted against their officers, fearing that they were going to be deployed against the Ottoman Empire, and they did not want to shoot against their fellow Muslims. And in East Africa, uh, there was a small uprising known as the Chilimbwe Uprising, uh, in which a number of East Africans resisted being drafted as laborers into the British army. So it's worth noting that the colonies played an integral part in the Allied war effort. That didn't always mean that it was done willingly. Individuals might have served in the colonial militaries because they saw it as an opportunity to better themselves, or if they were more altruistic, they might have seen it as an opportunity to help their nation achieve independence or self-rule faster otherwise by gaining the respect of their colonial masters. So when talking about nations outside of Europe that participate in World War One, Japan already had an alliance with Great Britain stretching back to 1902. And when war broke out, Japan was uniquely situated to attack a German colony in Qingdao on the Shandong Peninsula. It was actually a relatively short battle. Japan won it hands down. Germany only had about a thousand soldiers there, and Japan came with an army of 20,000. And then for the remainder of the war, Japan uh, mopped up the German island colonies in the Pacific, as well as patrolled the Pacific Ocean for German submarines that might have been operating there. But one of Japan's most bold moves during World War I was to try to take advantage of the distraction of the European powers to assert itself over China by presenting China with what's known as the 21 demands, which would have, if they were accepted, effectively made China a Japanese puppet. Now, this didn't happen because the Chinese immediately ran to the British and said, hey, Japan's trying to do this to us. And Britain interfered and said, no, you can't, uh, you can't make China your puppet state. But it really showed that Japan understood the situation amongst the European powers and sought to take advantage of their weakness 
to further its own agenda in East Asia. The Ottoman Empire and its role in World War I is also something that's worth examining. So the Young Turk government, in its effort to build a stronger, more centralized Ottoman Empire, decided to side with Germany out of its economic connections to Germany, such as the Berlin-Baghdad Railway, and its fears of a powerful Russia. And the Gallipoli campaign is probably the most famous battle that was fought on Turkish soil. And this was an effort by the British to essentially sort of knock Turkey out of the war in one foul swoop. The idea would be to secure the Dardanelles Strait, probably capture Constantinople slash Istanbul, and establish a supply line to Russia through the Black Sea. And it was believed that this would be a pretty easy move. And most of the fighters that went to fight were sepoys or Anzac soldiers. Uh, but they ended up getting stuck at the base of a few cliffs and they were there for almost a year and they finally had to withdraw unable to effectively capture the Dardanelles Strait. It was a major major victory for the Turks and one of their only major victories in the entire war because a little bit further south they were unfortunately not meeting with a lot of success. The British had uh entice the Arabs to revolt against the Turks in Arabia. And through a vicious guerrilla campaign, the Arabs did manage to drive the Turks out of Arabia effectively and push them all the way back into what is now Iraq and Jordan. Combine the defeats in the Middle East with the defeats that the Russians were dealing the Ottomans uh, in the Caucasus Mountains, and it becomes slightly more clear why the Ottoman government took the actions that it did next. Groups of Armenians, who did not like living under Ottoman rule, joined the Russian invaders in what is now Eastern Turkey. When the Russians broke through the Caucasus defenses and invaded the Ottoman Empire proper, a number of Armenians joined them. The Young Turks and the Ottoman government took this as an excuse uh, to order the deportation of all Armenians from the combat area. This is where things get a little tricky when we talk about genocide today. Officially, these orders were simply to deport and remove Armenians from the combat zone. However, reading just a little bit closer, it becomes very clear that the order to deport and remove them involved marching them into the desert with no water and no provisions, which would inevitably have led to their murder, and marching them into remote areas where there would not have been enough food to sustain them. So along the way, there were gangs of individuals who would murder Armenians and take their possessions, or the Ottoman soldiers escorting them sometimes would just murder them themselves. This deportation and murder uh, eventually resulted in the death of, of almost 2 million Armenians. And this is considered a genocide by almost every country in the world except for one country, Turkey, which claims it was in fact not a genocide, but that it was a deportation that just got a little out of hand and it was not an intentional effort uh, to destroy the Armenian population. However, I should note that many scholars who, who study documents in depth and in detail have noted that there was an intentional element to these deportation orders and there was an intentional element to not providing safety or provisions for the Armenians they were deporting. This is an intentional act of murder and therefore it qualifies as a genocide. As I said before, mass violence against the civilian populations is going to become a key theme that you're going to see again and again throughout warfare in the 20th century. And the Armenian genocide is just one of the first examples of this mass violence against civilians being perpetuated by a government in a total war context. So how did the war finally end? Well, the war really ended uh, with the US entry into the war. One of the things I personally like about World War I so much is how close it really was, even as late as 1917 it wasn't clear who was going to win. The Germans were battered. Uh, the British blockade for three years had led to a great deal of starvation, but the British themselves uh, were being beaten pretty badly. And the French, after 1917, were no longer able to mount an effective offensive. And so the Germans were not able to defeat the British Royal Navy on the high seas. It was simply too large. So they resorted to what they we call unrestricted submarine warfare. The idea was that they were going to send out their submarines and simply sink every single ship in the British Isles. Now, they had been doing this in the early stages of the war. However, the United States had protested that this was against uh, the laws of war that had been laid down at the 1908 Hague Peace Convention. And so the Germans stopped doing that until 1917, when it was believed that the only way they were going to be able to beat Britain and not uh, starve to death was to resume unrestricted submarine warfare. And this would eventually convince the United States government and their president, Woodrow Wilson, that the need to interfere uh, to end the war. There was also something called the Zimmerman Telegram, where Germany had attempted to encourage Mexico to attack the United States in an effort to distract them and prevent them from sending soldiers over to help uh, the British and the French. These are often listed as the two main reasons for the entrance of the U.S. into World War I. However, there's another interest, there's another reason why uh, that sometimes gets a little overlooked, and that is that the U.S. banking institutions had lent very large sums to the Allied powers. Uh, over the course of the war. And it was believed that if the Allied powers lost the war, 
to the central powers, U.S. banks would never get their money back. They'd never get their money back from Britain. They never get their money back from France. And so it's th there is a lot of evidence that the decision to enter the war was at least influenced by uh, banking interests who wanted to make sure they got a return on their funds from all the money they had lent uh, to the Allied powers of the course of the war. However, I don't. It's debatable if President Woodrow Wilson himself. Uh, was really interested in that. Wilson uh, was an idealist and a historian, and he spoke about making the world safe for democracy. And we'll talk a little bit more about Wilson's vision in the next lecture. But it was this combination of the blockade, uh, which starved Germany for three years, and the presence of U.S. troops in early 1918 that finally just overwhelmed uh, the German military. And in mid-1918, uh, the German Navy revolted against the government, and the Kaiser, or that is the Emperor of Germany, was forced to abdicate and flee into exile. And shortly thereafter, a new democratic German government signed an armistice and agreed to stop the fighting. And effectively, after four years of fighting, the war was over. So what did it cost? It's a good question. Um, if you take a look at this chart, you can see that in terms of total military deaths, if you put together all the major powers, you do come out uh, to something that looks uh, on the magnitude of about 10 million military deaths. And then you might get about uh, two or three million civilian deaths. And then perhaps somewhere in the magnitude of like 20 million wounded. And for a conflict that only lasted four years, like 10 million Military deaths is a pretty insane number, right? We don't see numbers like this very often in, in, so for example, the Taiping Rebellion might have seen the death of like five to 10 million individuals, and, but that's that's considered one of the most devastating domestic rebellions in human history. But World War I really shows the true cost of modern warfare. Millions of individuals dead, millions of individuals wounded um, for life, uh, crippled for life, maimed for life, missing limbs, missing eyes, uh, missing jaws, horrendous injuries that people suffered over the course of the war. And so it's worth noting that the new technology standard in World War I, as well as the total war mentality in which World War I was waged, did take a massive toll on human life over the course of the war. So I want to thank you for joining me. You should be able to answer those first two questions from the beginning of the lecture. My name is Mr. Little, and I'll see you next time.